Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. During this episode, we highlight the power of speech. What is the power of speech? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? The power of speech is the facility or power of speaking, oral communication, ability to express one's thoughts and emotion by speaking sounds and gestures. In short, it is the act of speaking. I am sure that some introvert entrepreneurs are thinking to themselves right now, I hate talking. No small talk, no public talk, no talk talk, no walkie talkie. I get it. I get it. Getting in front of people is not for everyone, but can be considered essential depending on what the entrepreneur decides to pursue. The power of speech helps win over a crowd and can be an especially important business skill to have. Negotiating, motivating, persuading, any entrepreneur that is selling a product or service will more than likely need to do one of the actions above, if not all in one transaction and then some. The goal is to use convincing language to stimulate intrigue and curiosity with a goal of kindling a passionate spark in others to motivate people. I have presented it at various conferences in front of varying size crowds. The most motivating speeches always have a personal component in them. I will speak about my family, my personal struggles, and my own self-doubt. I have found this tactic to humanize me as a person and help create a personal connection. There were several times I saw watery eyes in the crowd as I relayed personal stories and why those stories made me passionate about the subject I was speaking on. Aim to build trust. The power of speech is a way to influentially inform. Do not abuse that power. Remember all those Spider-Man movies they forced down our throat for the last 10 years? With great power comes great responsibility. That is the same with the power of speech. Using a platform to vomit inaccuracies is not only harmful to our society, but is also becoming harmful to our economy. And that is why the entrepreneur should care. According to a study by a sociologist, Andrew Zerdick, oral communication skills were the number one skill that college graduates found useful in the business world. Having public speaking skills may increase an entrepreneur's success in a chosen field. I equate this to a comedian. Being skilled in public speaking may be considered essential to that line of work as just one example. The power of speech can create entertainment and amusement, and more importantly, consult. Being empathetic, meaning feeling that someone else's feels, actively listening, not judging, being aware of nonverbal cues, can help create a loyal customer to the entrepreneur's endeavor. But don't take my word for it. I would encourage the listener to use their own words to strengthen our power of speech together. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am here with a good friend, folks, my barber. This man I have followed to different locations, Mr. Frank Wheatley. Paco, how we doing? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me. Man, thank you for coming on today. I'm really excited. I'm, I've am i been going to this man's shop, Classic Men Barbershop, for several years now. Uh, different locations. He has once one location and went to a different location, but I'll let Frank talk about it. Frank, introduce the world. Who is Frank? Hi, how you doing, man? I'm Frank Watley. Um, like you said, I'm the owner of Classic Men Barbershop. I've been in business as an owner for seven years now, but I've been a barber for 20. Um, I started off my uh, career in 1999. Wow. 
Yeah, so I've, I've been doing this a while. Uh, when we talk about who I am, I grew up in um, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, grew up in a two-family household, mother and father, up into the age of 10 years old. And we went from a two-family, I used to say like kind of like the Huxtables, where we sat around, had dinner together, big Christmases and all that stuff. We went from that to a, a one-bedroom apartment in uh, in the ghetto. Uh, so when, so growing up, have, living in the suburbs, the, you, you, the first part of your life, and then going to the ghetto is a big, it's a big change. It's a big change, and not only... Um, when we did move from um, we did move from the suburbs to uh, the ghetto um, or inner city, I, I like to use the term inner city. I don't know why I'm saying ghetto. But <laughs> there you go. Uh, the, the, into the inner city, um, um, that's where we ended up, and uh, yeah. So I went there, and I stayed with my mom for two years. I remember coming home at 12 years old, and my mom had all my bags packed on the uh, porch and she said um you're you know I was I wasn't a troublesome kid I got in a lot of trouble at that age and I think every kid kind of acts out a little bit when their parents uh go through some similar things but um I was acting out a little bit and my mom couldn't handle it and she said you're going to live with your father so I moved in with my father at um at, at this point and uh, this is where I think my entrepreneurial spirit came in is mm-hmm. because my father was a lounge singer. Okay. A lot of people don't know that. My father was one of the best. I, and I'm not saying that just because that's my father. He was really one of the best lounge singers in Cleveland. So my job on Fridays and Saturday nights was to carry all the equipment for the band. So they would give me five bucks. And it was about eight members of the band. So think about being 11, 12 years old, getting $40 every weekend. I was, I was doing well. Like when the yeah. ice cream truck came, I was buying <laughs> ice cream for my friends, you know? And, and, I, and that, that, in that moment, I knew how I loved hand to hand cash. I, it, it, it puts, it felt so good to have somebody put cash in my hand for hard work. And I knew right then I wanted to receive money in my hand for hard work. I, I knew that was me at 12 years old. So um, I uh, started actually playing sports. Now, everybody who knows me knows I'm the biggest Cleveland Browns fan. Me and my dad used to go to the training camps every summer. Big Cleveland Browns fan. Loved football. My dad was a diehard football fan. That was the way we connect. About 13 years old, I decided I wanted to play football. And when you play football, of course, I couldn't do that job anymore. And I actually ended up being pretty good. I was good enough to where some of the uh, Catholic schools wanted to recruit me to come play football there. Again, this is another way this shaped my life because going to a school that was predominantly black. In fact, let's not even tease predominantly um, I didn't go to school with a, a different race until high school. Oh, wow. So I went with all black kids my whole life. And then yeah. all of a sudden, a school says they like the way I perform in sports. So now they, I am going to a school that is predominantly white. Mm. It's a big change for me, and it was the greatest change. Because now I understand now as an adult how I can move in different rooms. And back then, you know, and you only wanted to appease your peers. But now I can appease people who are who are my peers but are in different classes. So that was another thing that helped me with my entrepreneurial spirit. Then um, after that, um, football, I did pretty good. I got recruited by a couple of small schools. And me being the, the – uh, I th- this is my bad Gemini, but me being the <laughs> arrogant person that I was, I was like, I should be being recruited by Ohio State or Michigan. <laughs> I, I'm a good football player. I'm not going to any of these schools. Not going to any of these schools. I'm not going to do it. 
And uh, uh, the story is, and my pastor, he loves this story. I love telling it to him. He Sometimes he asks me to tell him this story because he thinks that it, it is an amazing story. But at my school, after you graduate, everyone comes back for Christmas vacation and you go to the basketball game. That's what everybody do. All the teachers are there. They congratulate you. Everyone asks you what you're doing. Now, let's remember, I went to a Catholic school, and it was a college preparatory school. 99% of the students that I went to high school with went to college. We graduated 101 students. I was pretty much the (laughs) only person who did not go to college. Man. Man. Can you believe that? I'm the only person, at least that night. It may have been another guy. He didn't show. I was the only guy who didn't go to college. And I was embarrassed. I was completely embarrassed. Everybody's talking about all their new experiences and and, and life and being out on their own and their girlfriends and boyfriends and and drinking and, and doing drugs. And I'm still at home doing the same old thing. (laughs) So uh, I started cutting hair in high school a little bit. Um, I used to cut hair in like study hall and cut some of the teammates in the locker room. And I decided right then and there, I said, the only thing I know how to do is cut hair. So not even two days later, uh, I think it was like, January 3rd, I went to the barber school and enrolled. Now, when I get to the barber school, I think like it's like school. You enroll and you just go. No, you got to pay. So I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. How, well, how much is it? Well, luckily, back then, we think of it now, Catholic, um, Catholic school was $4,000 a month, I think. Um, my barber education was going to be $5,000. I had nothing. The only thing I was doing was, uh, at the time, was selling weed. (laughs) And uh, I wasn't even good at that. (laughs) So I'm like, wow, um, how do I come up with this $5,000? So I I talked to my dad. My dad is still pissed at me that I didn't go to some of these small schools. And he said, I think you should still pursue football and all that. So me and my dad didn't talk for a while, but I decided on my own that I said, well, I'm going to get this money some kind of way. So I hustled up the money the best way I knew how. I uh, I sold things that didn't matter, and I um, was able to put that $1,000 down payment down, and I was on a payment plan. So during barber school, I um, worked at Bally's Total Fitness. The whole time I was a, I was a janitor. So I cleaned up the weight rooms and the, in the locker rooms and things like that. And that's how I paid for my education. As soon as I paid off barber school, I quit that. And the rest was history. I, um, I, and then uh, I think at the end, i never forget it. It was one of the happiest days of my life. Um, two months before I graduated, my dad walked through the barber school door and got his hair cut by me. And, and he told me he was proud of me. And uh, that's one of those days that uh, I remember to this day. You know, he, he, he finally approved and he finally supported me. And he, and he came in and got his hair cut and he gave me a $100 tip. And I don't know, back then, you know, a $100 tip was huge and <laughs> I needed it. Man, you know, it's so big I, today. I needed it so bad. So it was a great day. And um, he, he, he became one of my best clients, even after I graduated uh, barber school and went into my own shop, he became one of my best clients. So the, um, the reason I say this, when you ask who is Frank Watley, um, you get to know that I'm very um, resilient, very resilient. And, uh, and I'll fight for, for what I want. And when I decide that this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do. I like it. Now, Classic Men, why, why the name Classic Men? <laughs> so funny. Okay, so um, we're going to go through this interview finding out how much of an idiot I am. <laughs> and this is uh, 
this is the first take <laughs> of, of, of me being an idiot is um, I had no name for the barbershop. It got to two weeks before I opened. I still had no name. For the <laughs> I had no name. Um, the names I was, I didn't want to name it Frank's Barbershop. I just thought that was just like old school and corny. And I wanted to name it That's Him Barbershop because every time uh, guys got finished getting a haircut, they look in the mirror and I say, is that him? And he's like, yeah, that's him. Yeah. So I wanted to name it that, but then I also said, uh, that, that's so personal and, and, and corny as well. So I was like, I didn't want to do that. And um, I don't know how I remembered this, but in barber school, uh, you, they make you go through the whole marketing scheme of opening your own barbershop and setting everything up. And that was the name I used for my barbershop in that. So that's the name I said, I'm going to go ahead and choose. So uh, you didn't just start the barber. Did you just start the barbershop as soon as you became a barber or did you actually cut some hairs before that and kind of work under somebody? No, no, no. Um, as soon as I got out of barber school. So um, quick story is um, I have seven barbers in my family and my uncle owned a barbershop where five of those seven all worked in there. So when I got out of barber school, I was able to go into my uncle's barbershop with five other family members, which was the greatest, the greatest gift that anyone can give someone who wants to be a owner or, or, or want to go into business is to a lot of people is to, uh, sorry, is to go in with family, but a lot of people like really mean mug, like going into business with family. But if there's a mutual respect amongst the family members, knowing that this is business and this is family, it's a, it's a different cause, and that's what it was, and 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 they took me on like they wanted me to be great. They wanted me to be great, so they pushed me and they and they helped me, and and it was a it was real love, along with you know business. What is something that you that they taught you that you were like, damn, that makes sense. Why didn't I think about that? My uncle taught me how to control a room. That was one of the, the things that, and to this day, uh, I understood is when every when there's a conversation going on in the barbershop, how to actually control that conversation. Like he would, uh, I don't know if you ever watch Curb Your Enthusiasm. <laughs> I do. But so Larry David yeah. talked about being the middle in, in at the dinner table, how you can push the conversation and and carry the conversation without actually being a conversationalist. And I learned that from him. He would show me how to, like, ah, barbershop's a little quiet. Let me watch this. And he would go and start making conversation out of nowhere. Now everybody in the barbershop is talking and having fun. And he taught me how to do that. Nice. I, I know how to do that, and I, I excel at it. What? So when when was the transition between being the barber at the uncle shop to being the entrepreneur and the owner of your own barbershop? Very good question. So um, my uncle used to cut an NBA player, um, Terrell Brandon, that, that is out here in Portland. And one day, um, my uncle, he's what, he's 73 years old. So he was probably about, he was, in his, he was getting close to his 60s then. And um, he couldn't cut his hair that night. So he sent me because he, he was tired or whatever he was going through. He didn't feel like doing it. So he sent me and I cut his hair. And after I cut his hair, I started cutting his hair more and more. And I became his barber after that. So now I'm cutting an NBA player and people in the neighborhood are starting to see it. So now they want to come to me. So it was like almost like an overnight success situation where um, I was known as an NBA barber or whatever you want to call that. I don't know. But, um, I started cutting his hair and he asked me to move out to Portland to work in his barbershop because I had been cutting his hair. And at first I said, no, I'm not moving to Portland. I'm from Cleveland. I love <laughs> Cleveland. Cleveland's me. I'm, I'm Cleveland. I love the Browns. I love the Cavs. I'm not going anywhere. And then he, um, and then something happened. One of my good friends, uh, actually, um, got into some trouble 
and he actually um he actually murdered someone and the the family and friends of that person were out to get anybody who knew him and i used to go to the club with him all the time i was you know it was my best friend growing up and there was a ch- possibility that they could have been trying to get to me as well. I, I'm not saying there was never any conversation to say, hey, well, people did tell me, hey, you know, I want to watch it back, but there was never any for sure. But it was almost like a Fresh Prince of Bel-Air situation. <laughs> <laughs> it was almost like that. So I um, I called Terrell and I asked, and I said, hey, man, do you still want me to come out to Portland? He was like, sure. So then I moved out to Portland. So I kind of... I kind of ran under my uncle, then schooled by Terrell, and I, Terrell taught me the business outside of the business. Like, I understood the barbering business from my uncle, but Terrell kind of showed me how to maneuver and how to market and how to give back to the community and watch the community come to you. And that's what transitioned me to understand that I could be an owner myself. You know, you, you just mentioned community, and I noticed that's something – I've been working with you quite some time. Community is something you're big into, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Why? Why is it so important to you? Because when, when I was working in Will's Barbershop, um, the community gave so much to me. So the, the barbershop in Cleveland that I worked at, it was across the street from the projects. So um, I remember, and it was a scary time, my uncle gave me a gun. And he said, hey, you've been here by yourself a lot. He said, I've been robbed. He said, you don't never want to be robbed. Here's a gun. Just keep it at your station. If something happens, it happens, you know, but you, you need to be able to protect yourself. So all the kids in the neighborhood, they always knew what time I was getting off. They would come to the barbershop and walk out with me. So back then, walking out of the barbershop on a Saturday with five hundred dollars—that's a lot of money. You've been working all day, you made about five, four, five hundred dollars, and people used to rob barbershops because it was always cash back yeah. then. It's not card like it is yeah. now. So the kids in the neighborhood would come and walk out the barbershop with me, and uh, I don't know if you, you guys are familiar with—we uh, had those melt metal gates. Mm, that you yep. had to let down. Yep. You turned the key and then the, the metal gate let down to cover up the glass and the whole barbershop. And they would stand there with me the whole time. Make sure nobody bothered me. The community looked out for me. And I just believe in, in I just believe in like paying it forward. And I believe that I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for some people in my community. So I always want to give back. I always want to be there. I always want to help out people because you never know when you could be that people. Yeah. So you're working over at Terrell Brandon shop, right? You move over to Oregon. How did you then finance or how did you then pivot? Or did you, did you have another stop in between before you went to classic men? <laughs> there was no pivot. There was no finance. It's the weirdest story ever. And I'm going to tell it because I'm here. So um, I started to get homesick. I had been out here for eight, maybe. No, I had been out here 10 years. And I started to get homesick. And I told, I talked to Terrell and I said, hey, I gave you 10 years of my life. And, you know, the barbershop's doing great. And I think I want to move back home. I think, I think I'm done with this. And he was like, well, whatever you want to do, I support you 100%. And I said, all right. So I talked to him about it, and I started making transitions into moving back to Cleveland. And um, one of my clients said, hey, man, are you ever thought about opening up your own barbershop? And I said, I thought about it, but I don't really think it's for me. And then uh, he said, well, this is a great location out in Beaverton that I was trying to get to, to open up a weed store, but you should go look at it. I said, I'm, I'm thinking about moving back to Cleveland. I ain't, I'm not telling people this right now. Only people know is my family in Terrell. But I'm, I'm saying, uh, maybe, I don't know. And uh, he talked me into just going to see the space. 
So I go and see the space. And the guy said it had been vacant for so many years that he would give me a deal that I couldn't refuse. And that was it. (laughs) I said, I couldn't believe that that was the deal that he was going to give me. And I said, this has to be a gift from God. Like, or this is a sign. Like, I need to stay here because there's no way that somebody can give me rent this cheap doing anything. And that was, that was it. So how did you then build your team, right? Because you you had more than one chairs in that shop. Well, for the first two years, I was there by myself. How hard was that? Horrible. So it's horrible. I hated it. And I don't know how I got through it. Because, um, and I'm good at just talking to my clients. But think about always being in a shop where I've always worked with other barbers. I've always... Like in my uncle's shop, it was six barbers there. And at Terrell's, it was four. And I'm always used to being in a room full of people. And now you can hear my echo in, in the barbershop. It was hard. So how I built my team is I started uh, working at a, a um, barber school, well, a cosmetology school. And when I work, I would work there. <laughs> get this. I would work there from 8 a.m., to 10 a.m., go to the shop from 11 to 7 and work. I mean, sorry, actually 6.30, and then go back to the cosmetology school from 7 to 10. That was my schedule, and that was how I got my first crew of barbers where they were my students. But that's what I needed to do at the time in order to get – to get barbers because I thought I was this guy, but I I come to find out that nobody wanted to work with me just because of who I thought I was. Like they, they didn't want to work with me. Like, so I had to go out and, and, and use my resources that way. So I was able to get uh, three guys from that school. And after that, you know, more barbers came along and the shop started to, to do well. And, Then it started to do great. Did you ever have a moment in that period or or any time of (laughs) self-doubt? Shit. (laughs) Self-doubt. I'm I'm doubting this interview right now. (laughs) Like, um, I mean, I'd struggle with self-doubt so much. It's ridiculous. But but one thing I'm able to do with my self-doubt is I'll do it anyway. Like, even though I'm doubting myself, I will physically do it anyway. And I think a lot of people need to know that self-doubt is, is not a curse. It's not a bad thing. It's just your mind telling you that you can't do something that your body is willing to do. And you have to just go ahead and do it anyway. And that's and that's what I do. But I, I doubt I doubt a lot about myself. Just just Saturday, I was just saying like, oh, I feel like I'm one of the best barbers in Portland. But this haircut, I don't really like. <laughs> and when I gave the guy the mirror, he said, "Man, it's the best haircut I ever had." You see that? <laughs> you see that? That's how it goes, though. He says it's the best haircut he ever had, and I'm sitting up here saying, "I I thought it it could have been better," you know. So every, I think I think it's a normal thing, and I think it's a healthy thing if you use it in that capacity, you know. So I like it. Yeah, no, it's very true. So now you built your team, you have the shop, you have cheap rent, but then you move. Yeah, you move to a different location. Well, <laughs> one thing uh, about business, and 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 people need to understand, and all the entrepreneurs understand is, yes, you do have cheap rent. At first, mm. you got to read that contract. Mm. You make sure you read that lease because, yes, on the on the front end, the rent was very cheap. The rent was so manageable, I, I, I was able to make it. And if it wasn't for that manageable rent, trust me, I wouldn't have made it. I would have, I, I wouldn't have made it six months. But on the back end, see, um, there's a thing where the rent goes in steps it's almost like steps where it increases well because my rent was so cheap on the front end 
it increased dramatically. It's almost like in 2008, the the the, the housing market where they got into those flexible uh, yep. loans. Yeah. And then when it when it kicked in, he was like, "Great oh example, my God." So yeah, it kicked in, and I was like, "Hold on, I went from a thousand dollars to three thousand dollars," and 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 the leasing agent looked at me and he said, "Yeah, wait till next year because it's going up to thirty eight hundred, and then after that it's going up to forty five hundred. So you know, but." I understood the hustle and I got it. I get it. I get right. it. Cause he took a chance on me. Yeah. You know, I got it. But in business, people need to understand is you know, don't fall in love with any of this shit. Don't fall in love with none of this shit. It's business. It's not, Oh, well I've been in this location. I love this. Look none of that means anything. What you need to make sure you do is make sure that your bottom line is taken care of. You need to make sure that whatever you have to pay out is dramatically cheaper than what you bring in. And that's what it's about. It's not about it's not about loving or being nostalgic. Nostalgia and business do not mix. Do not be nostalgic about any of this stuff. It's about the bottom line. How can I increase my revenue and make sure that I'm paying out cheaper? Yeah. So that's why I moved. I moved because I, I downsized. I got a better location, uh, and got and because now that I know how to negotiate, I even got a better deal. In, in hindsight, like of course, twelve hundred dollars a month is remarkable, but in hindsight, I got a better deal because it's flat, it's fixed. Right. I don't have to worry about it going up and. And doing all that weird stuff, it's fixed. I'm good. I know how much I need to make. And at this point, I, I, I can make it in a couple of days. Nice. Now, as a small business owner, what keeps you up at night? My employees. 100%. My employees, man. I, 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 I worry about them. I worry about their families. You know what I'm saying? I think about them. I, I want them to be successful because I know how they look at it. They look at, at my books and they look at, oh, you're booked two weeks out or you're booked a week and a half out. Like, how do you do it? You know, and and I don't want them to think that working with me that I am feel like I'm above them or I'm better than them. Like, no, we all work together. You know, just because you see this, you you didn't see all the the other stuff. You know, you it's like the what they call the swan, where they look so graceful, and then under the the legs, yeah, they're, oh, they're yeah, paddling the, is <laughs> how you, like 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 you don't understand what it takes to keep this up. So I, I I do I worry about them. I want them to all be successful too, but I want them to understand that if you get it if you get it slower. You'll you'll love it more, whereas if you have you have that quick success, it can go away just as fast as it came. So yeah, that keeps me up at night. Also, what keeps me up at night is also like being the best rep- representation of myself, like keeping up what people think about you. You know, like everybody looks at me and thinks, you know, uh, not everybody. No, nah, that that sounds a little arrogant. Let's say just. People who onlookers who look on me and say, "Hey, man, you're successful. You're a successful businessman. I look up to you. You're an inspiration. Things like that." And you you want to keep that up, you know. You you want people to think that 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 you got it all handled, but there's no way to handle all of that. You just just you know you just work. Yeah, you know one one of the things you mentioned is your workers do see you and they see that you're booked out two weeks, right? And and, and I'll tell you folks listening right now. I, I changed my entire schedule just to get on this guy's schedule, right? Two weeks out. How do you brand yourself? How do, how do you market yourself? How did you build this up? Oh, oh, guerrilla marketing. Guerrilla marketing. I, 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 when I first opened my shop um, seven years ago, um, I thought all my clients from Terrell's were just going to come over and I was just going to make the same amount of money. <laughs> no, they didn't. In fact, not even half maybe a fourth. So imagine being busy all day and, 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 and then now you're sitting around waiting for people to come in. 
eye opener. What a humbling situation. So I went back to the grassroots. Everybody I talked to knew my business before they knew me. You don't even know my name. Hey, Classic Men Barbershop, have you been there? I, I, I branded myself as a barber before a person. I talked to people about the barbershop before I even talked. I went out every night. I didn't go out to party. I went out to talk. I got out to give out business cards. I went out to make sure that people, like, the first time you see me and I told you I had a barbershop, you'll probably say, oh, that's cool. You got a barbershop. Go back to doing what you're doing. Second time you see me and I told you, hey, you ain't been to my barbershop yet. You probably be like, oh, no, no. Third time you probably going to be like, man, I need to come to your barbershop. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Stop telling me about it. I done talked to you like three or four times. You seem cool. Uh, I'm going to come out. I'm going yep. to come see you. And, they, and, and when they say that, four out of five times, they're, co- they're actually going to come. And if you have the prowess and the work behind you to back it up, they become clients. Yeah. And you know, strangely enough, the first location you had was like my backyard. Like it was walking distance to my house. All the folks I never, I never walked to that damn barbershop. I always drove mm-hmm. <laughs> just cause, mm-hmm. but nonetheless, I would walk in a few times and I'm like, sorry, the, cause you had that walk-in special. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm booked out. I'm booked mm-hmm. out. I'm like, damn, I just need to, these guys seem cool. There's TVs. There's a pool table in here. Mm-hmm. I need, I need to figure out how to get, and soon I got on that schedule, finally get on the schedule. I'm like, oh yeah, this is exactly what I thought the, the, the kind of culture that you built in that, mm-hmm. in that space is very welcoming. Now, what advice would you give some of these aspiring barbers or entrepreneurs? What advice would you give some? Don't listen to Instagram. That's my number one advice. Do not listen to Instagram. Instagram is a liar, and not only is a liar, it's a cheat. Do not listen to it. Just because you see all these beautiful haircuts done by these barbers and all these things is is just not true. The best way to build clientele, the best way to, to make it in this business is consistency. You need to be in a location. That people can find you. Like, remember, I don't know if y'all, if you're still listening to this interview, I said earlier that I've been a barber for 20 years. You've only heard me mention three barbershops because I've only been in three in 20 years. Well, I've known some barbers that's been in three in one year. Consistent people need to be able to find you. And when they do find you, Make sure that the haircut is consistent. If you follow me on Instagram, I barely post. I barely, I post for the barbershop, the deals, the specials, the conversation for the day about the barbershop. But personally, I barely post because my work speaks for itself. Like word of mouth is your best friend. Don't let nobody leave your business with something bad to say about you. That's really good advice. You know, and that's kind of goes back to that imposter syndrome that we've discussed that previous on the show is, you know, you, you kind of have to go out there and, and don't, don't look at social media as this is what I want to aspire to be. Instead of being a social media influencer, be an influencer in your community. There you go. You know, now what advice would you give a younger Frank? Whew. That's a hell of a question. That's the best question I've been asked in years. What would I tell a younger Frank? You know, I would definitely say don't don't get caught up in what other people think about you. That would be the best advice. Because one of the things that made me such a good barber is is I'm very insecure. Very insecure very insecure like I didn't really realize it until I turned 40 like when I turned 40 I realized like I started to aspire to just be myself no matter what but as a younger man I was very insecure so I cared about what everybody else thought and if I if if I could go back and talk to 21 or 20 year old Frank I would tell him like don't it don't matter I'm talking to you from the future it don't matter they're gonna say it anyway It doesn't matter. Just if you're able to wake up and smile and go do something that you love to do, that you're passionate about, you've won. Like right now, I 
I feel like at, at, at this stage in my, in my life and in my career that I've kicked life's ass because for 20 years, I've been able to do something I love. I've been flown to different states and I worked on a TV show and, 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 and I've done multiple NBA and famous people. Like I've, I've, I've won. So there's no need for me to ever, you know, be insecure about anything. So if I could tell 20 year old Frank, like, yo, you're going to win no matter what anybody thinks or says, I, I, I think I, I would have, um, I wouldn't have to stress as much or wouldn't have the burden of not sleeping and all of those things that come along with worry. Yeah. Yeah. Now for the folks at home, you mentioned your consistency and staying in the same location. How, where can they find you? Where can you find you on the social media and your physical brick and mortar location? Oh, physical brick and mortar location is um, in Beaverton, Oregon. And that's uh, 113 Southwest Canyon. And uh, on Instagram, you can follow me at class, classic, class men PDX. Sorry. That's class men PDX on IG. And um, uh, if you ever want to book an appointment, you can book an appointment at uh classic men pdx.com and you can book appointments there or you know what just stop in and look at the place I, <laughs> I, once you look at the place you're probably going to say this is this is home this is where i need to be it's a vibe it's a vibe so man frank thank you so much paco my my homie my my barber don't be coming don't folks don't be dead uh, taking my schedule on Thursdays though, man. That's Thursday at two o'clock is my spot. So I'll be taking my spot, man. Pac, man, I have to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, thank you for being an inspiration for the community. Before we go, I do want you to actually give a shout out to the, uh, you, one of the, um, community events that you have for the shoes. Uh, so I do want you to talk about that real quick. So listeners, Pac, tell us about what you're doing with the kids. Oh, Jeff's shoe challenge. So everyone, um, every year before school starts, me and my friend Jeff, we've came up with this thing where we um, collect shoes for kids to go back to school. And uh, we don't collect, uh, like, dirty or, or old shoes. We mostly go after sneakerheads who have a surplus of shoes. I'm like, hey, man, you give me two or three pairs of them shoes that you know you're not going to wear anymore. <laughs> Or you haven't worn, you bought, and you you they're dead stock, and you never you know you're never going to give give me them. So they they we we collect all the shoes at the shop, and uh, we can also collect socks, and we get things donated, t shirts and clothes from Nike and Adidas, and even Under Armour gave us some stuff. And what we do is we create a shopping experience. See, one thing about charity is don't make people feel like you're giving them charity. Like, don't belittle people by sticking your phones in their face while you're trying to give mm, them something. Man, preach. You please. know what I mean? Like, please. We set up a shopping experience. So when you get there, the kids, they have their own concierge who takes them around to, to, to their size. They pick out their shoes. They pick out their socks. They pick out their clothes. And then they bring them around to me and my fellow barbers. And then we give them a haircut. And then they go off to school feeling good and and that's what it's about like it's, it's it's about giving people an opportunity to feel good about themselves and and it doesn't even feel like you it was free it felt like something that you would pay for like not not a not a donation but a gift yeah so folks man coming around august i think we usually yeah, start so it's august right before school i think i think we set on august I'm not sure yet because we um, we're, we haven't exactly started organizing yet, but it's always, uh, it'll be at Park Rose High School is where uh, we'll be doing it. And um, we'll be start taking donations for shoes in July. And I think uh, last year we had over 500 pairs of shoes or something like that. Yeah, I think it was like 500 pairs of shoes. So like we did, we did very well. And um, I hope to... Uh, do the same thing this year. Yeah. So folks at home that are listening, I know a lot of sneakerheads out there, especially in this Portland area, uh, or those folks that may the work at the Nike Adidas under armor, new balance, you know, all those different locations, 
please, this is a really good cause. Uh, I've I've been donating for a couple of years now because uh, I do have a surplus of shoes. <laughs> I need to be getting rid of my my wife keeps telling me to get rid of these damn shoes. So please, please, Frank, again, thank you so much for bringing on the show. We really do appreciate it. A great, great story. Uh, I'm I'm always you'll you'll be seeing me next week, man. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Folks at home, you can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.